So, uh, good evening all. Yes, my name is Olaf Deagle and I've got 20 minutes to talk to you about something that I think is probably the most exciting topic in the world. Um, I'm going to try to use this as my sort of egg timer of sorts. All going well by the time the 20 minutes is up, this part will have finished printing. So I'll try to use it as timing mechanism. So what we're doing, we're talking about 3D printing today. Now what 3D printing is in the simplest terms, in the old days, if you wanted to make something, you wanted to make an object, you started, let's say you want to make the skull, you would have started with a block of material. So for example, you would have had a block of marble, you would have taken your chisel, and you would have carved away all the marble you don't want until you're left with the object. A slightly newer way of doing the same thing is use a computer-controlled machine, so a CNC machine, to do the same thing. You start with a block of whatever material, could be aluminium, could be plastic, and your computer-controlled machine, machine so cuts away all the material until you're left with the part you want. So of course, one of the implications with that process is you waste a lot of material. So all the material you cut away gets thrown away. Some materials can be recycled, but not all. What these, this is sort of, I hesitate to say new technology because it's actually been around for close to 20 years now, but this is a way that, a technology that works in a different way. What it does is, Today, when you design something, you almost always design it in 3D on a computer. So you build a virtual model of it on the computer. These technologies, what they do, this is the simplest explanation I've got for it. This is a little wooden sphinx. You can buy this at any curio shop. The software for the machine takes your virtual model, slices it up into thin slices, and then builds the model one slice at a time, sort of one slice on top of the next slice on top of the next slice until the model's finished. So in principle, very simple. And of course, this is pretty crude. But as your, start, start to get, as your slices start to get thinner and thinner and thinner, the quality of your model gets better and better and better. Now, what I'll try to do tonight is give you sort of maybe five, 10 minutes on what the technologies are used for today, and then maybe another five, 10 minutes on where they're heading, some of the, some of the future ways that these technologies are developing. And I thought the best way of demonstrating some of these things was to bring samples and to pass them around for you guys to have a touch and a feel of them. Um, there's probably about five different technologies. All the technologies work in exactly the same way in, in that they build the part layer by layer by layer, one on top of the next. Where they differ is what material they use and how they make that, the layer for that material. So, to give you a very simple example, this particular process called selective laser sintering puts down a layer of powdered material and a laser scans the slice of the model and melts the powder where it needs to for that slice of the model. Then it drops down, scrapes another layer of powder on top, melts it where it needs to, and so on. So at the end, you sort of play dinosaur hunter. You've got a bed full of powder, and with a paintbrush, you, paint away, you brush away all the loose powder, and the object comes out. Now what's pretty amazing with these technologies, you look at something like this. This is a relatively complex mechanism. This is printed in one piece. No assembly required. So it's got a lot of moving parts inside, but because of the precision of the machine, it only melts the powder where it needs to, so it leaves you with a fully working assembly that you can take apart with no you know, assembly required. Which is actually fantastic. When you think about it in terms of reliability, it's got huge implications. This is also, again, one of my very favorite parts, sort of a bit of chain mail, also printed in one piece. So very, very exciting stuff in terms of just touching and feeling the technology for real. Um, just while we talk, I'll pass around a few, a few of the other technologies just so you can get an idea. This one here is one of the technologies, also a powder technology, works in plaster of Paris. Puts down a layer of plaster of Paris and prints glue, so to speak, onto the part. And again, layer by layer by layer, it builds it up. And this one prints in color as you go. So you can design your product with logos, company logos, colors, and it comes out of the machine ready to go. Now when you pass this one around, this is plaster of Paris, so it is what it sounds like. Uh, try not to crush it, because you will. <laughs> and again, this one is an epoxy-based technology. So it's a liquid-based technology, puts down a layer of liquid resin, and a UV laser hardens the resin where it needs to. But again, when you pass this one around, look at the inside of it. Look at the detail on the inside of that, the spiral staircase on the inside. So afterwards, I've got plenty more here that you can have a look at. Um, this one here is what's called fused deposition model. The simplest description is a hot glue gun. You take a hot glue gun and you trace out each slice of the model with a hot glue gun and repeat it layer upon layer upon layer until it's done. 
Where these technologies are used today, they're used extensively in product development. If you're a company and you design products, the cost to go into manufacturing can be huge. So you use these technologies to try out your ideas before you commit big money to tooling up for them. Um, very, very simple example. This is sort of a negative example of it. This is a product I did a few years ago. This one, I wasn't actually involved with this particular product. This is a blood pressure monitor. Strap this on the arm. The doctor looks at it, pumps it up, and reads your blood pressure on the digital display. Problem is, they forgot about left-handed doctors. Left-handed doctors grab it. They can't pump it because the handle's on the wrong side. We redesigned it for them. So this is where I got involved. We redesigned it with a rotatable handle from left-handed to right-handed. Silly example, for them to fix their tooling cost them nearly $70,000. It's a lot of money. They essentially had to block off half their tooling and scrap half of it, so to speak, and make a new tool for the handle. Now, if they had done that ahead of time, before they went into production, they would have not only saved themselves a lot of money by getting it right, but also the bigger risk to me is the customers they may have lost. All the left-handed doctors who say, well, I'm never buying from them again. Another very simple example. This is probably, I've, I've done a lot of medical stuff, sort of medical sort of technologies. This is a high-end blood pressure monitor. Takes two blood pressures at the same time. So on your arm and your ankle and tells you if you have any blocked arteries. It's your arterial stiffness index. It's relatively simple, so to speak, but it's an expensive bit of technology. This retails in Europe for about 3,000 euro, so about close to 6,000 New Zealand dollars in terms of the price of the product. When we designed this, we designed it for a Swiss company, we designed it with what we thought was a user in mind. We designed it to be small, gray, and invisible. We figured the users would want to put it on their desk and nobody would notice it. The whole idea is you don't want people coming to your home and saying, ooh, you're diseased. So we thought we'd design it so it was invisible, so nobody would notice it. We did seven prototypes, again, 3D printed on the same machine as this, which is essentially a bigger version of this. So all printed with the electronics done the traditional way. We did seven prototypes, sent them around doctors in France for clinical trials. They loved the product, but they hated the way it looked. They thought, you know, we're spending 3,000 euro on this. I think the technical term is we want something with a bit of bling. They wanted something where their doctor mates would come into the office and say, ooh, you've got one of those. So we redesigned this for them into, it was a tower case about this high, silver, of course. Um, on the inside, we had slots on the bottom, so we put metal plates on the inside to make it heavier. It's, it's a stupid example, but it's a good example at the same time where it shows that if we had gone to market with this, this might be somewhere around 100,000 to 150,000 New Zealand dollars worth of tooling maybe a bit cheaper if we do it in China. You can imagine you spend that kind of money, then you find out you got it wrong. Very, very big problems. So currently, this is where I'd say 90% of the technology is being used today. It's for doing prototypes of products that you want to take to market to try out your ideas.